We've moved our study of Ephesians in the area we were in Ephesians to this afternoon. I want to continue with that for a little while longer than even today. As a child of God, and that's how he approaches, remember, in the beginning of chapter 5, the people that he addresses, notice, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. In other words, we're not following God because we're made to, forced to, we don't want to, we begrudge it. We're following God as our Father, as His dear children, and we recognize it. We've established already the fact that uh, when He says, be ye, that is a command. This is the way you ought to be. There's no choice. If you will be faithful, you will live as I'm telling you. It's one thing to say, be faithful to Christ all the days of your life. That's just in general. But what's involved? What's involved in the particulars of being faithful? Paul goes into some of that here. And since most of the New Testament's written to those who are Christians, then we've referred you already back to Galatians 5 where he talks about the works of the flesh and those who practice those things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he talks about the singular fruit of the Spirit. But even there, he will give you the component parts of that singular fruit. And so you see here in chapter 5, as he does in other places, he's giving you the particulars of what it is to be in general faithful. So being faithful involves a number of things. We are a holy people. We're holy ones. We don't normally refer to us in that way. We ought to. Look at how many times the Bible says we, as God's children, the church, are holy. And we've been made holy because of our faith and obedient faith in Christ. We put these things into practice in our mind. We exercise ourselves according to to godliness. You know, since uh, the doctor advised me about three years ago to go through uh, this cardiac arrangement and the exercises, and I finished with that, I started going, just got in the habit of it, and that's good, started going every day. And I go either five or most of the time six days to exercise. I, I, I sort of find it interesting to look at these people who have no thought of God. You can see that by the, by the way they're acting and the way they look. But they have a physique that won't wait as far as that's concerned. And uh, you watch them and they work so hard and they'll even watch the machine they're on and the muscle they're supposed to be strengthening. They'll sit there and they strain and they'll do that. And I think now, think about that when it comes to the inner man and strengthening the inner man. You have to you have to lift something heavy, and in effect, it will, as far as the muscles are concerned, you have to break them down before they get stronger. Well, we don't like a lot of the things we have to face in this life in order to do what God told us to do and tells us to do. It takes effort. It takes mental effort. It takes concentration. It takes uh, sometimes reproaching yourself, rebuking yourself. Being ashamed of yourself. And then you come back and you hit it again. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, I think of those folks over there. Those folks that really are bodybuilders, they're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in those things that build up their muscles. And you can see it. Well, it's amazing how God chose things like that to say it works the same way when it comes to being spiritual. You, having free will, must will to do it and to do it God's way. Notice we're called out of darkness. What does that mean? Well, darkness means not knowing the truth, that which is contrary to the truth, wicked things. But now we've been called out of darkness. Now, what do we talk about this morning? The gospel. That's what calls us out of darkness. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the reason Jesus gave the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's God calling people out of darkness, out of error, out of sin, out of living according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So he says to the Ephesians, you're called out of darkness. And he also said it to Colossians, Colossians 1.13. 
to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. So as Christians, ours is that of the giving of thanks. That seems appropriate to be in this lesson this week. I didn't time it as such, but it's turned out that this is Thanksgiving week. If ever there was a man-made holiday that is one a Christian should rejoice in, it's Thanksgiving. Of course, every day is Thanksgiving is what we ought to be, but I'm glad there's a national holiday in this country, Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks. Here in this secular world where people rule out God more and more or they have a false concept of God or even Christianity or Christ, it's good to know, though, that we give thanks. I've often wondered, what does the atheist do at Thanksgiving dinner? Think about that for a minute. I guess he could give thanks to himself and to anybody else, but we know that this is set up and we are to give thanks all the time here to God. James 1, verse 27, talks about pure and undefiled religion. And when you read through James, you'll see that he also talks about God gives us readily everything that's good. He always has because he is good. God is love. The heart was welcomed, has welcomed the gracious change as a Christian. You can't be a Christian and not change your heart. Well, what do I mean by heart? I, I don't mean the blood pump. I mean the inward man, the mind, the real you that dwells in this body for a while. When the body dies, it goes back in, to God who gave it, the writer of Ecclesiastes said. And because we have free will, we recognize the difference in truth and falsehood and spiritual truth and falsehood. And we choose by free will to receive and be under, have an understanding that comes from receiving the truth of God and we change from darkness, error, sin, wickedness to light according to the truth. 1 John 1, 5 and verse 7, John 8, 12. So now we're walking as a child of light. Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. How do you do that? Well, part of it is that we constantly realize from whom all blessings flow. The word thanks is from the Greek word eucharistia, <clears throat> which is from the compound word you, as you would pronounce it in Greek, which means well, W-E-L-L, -L, and charizomai, to give freely, to give freely. It simply means that what we offer, uh, our gratitude, our thankfulness this thanks is easily seen from all kinds of passages i wouldn't know where to begin because when you, when you begin to look at the new testament think of the times and ways that we're admonished to give thanks to god acts 24 3 first corinthians 14 16 and on and on you could go to give thanks to show appreciation i think one of the greatest things that we can ever teach ourselves, first of all, or mom and daddy can teach their children, is to be thankful. Used to, you know, we talk about manners. And actually, if you go back, back in the 19th century, they had what was called finishing schools, where they sent mainly girls off to learn how to be feminine, to act in such ways. And... You actually had courses taught in school for everybody to where they were taught, and you remember this, please and thank you. Well, you don't hear that a lot nowadays, but yet that's part of it. It's part of what we are. It's a very important thing to teach your children to be thankful. Somebody says, well, my mom and daddy wasn't anything. They never was anything to me but mean. They left me. They did this, that, and the other. Well, they may have been. I'm not saying they're not. But in giving you life, they gave you the opportunity to go to heaven. I don't care what kind of people they are. And you wouldn't have that opportunity to go to heaven if they had not given you life. 
You can be thankful even for that. We're not talking about being thankful for error and sin and wickedness. But sometimes we're kind of small in our scope when it comes to who we can be thankful for. Well, my mother and daddy could have been better people than they were. Yeah, and you could too. And <laughs> I could too. And now that we've received remission of sins and the Christians and been added to the church by the Lord when we were baptized into Christ, then we spend our lives being better. Doing all we can to understand the truth, to grow in that knowledge. From Paul, the author of this book, of course, this letter, it seems that he sums this up in Ephesians 5 and verse 20. Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, by the authority of Christ. Because we approach the Father through the Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him. He's the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So giving thanks always for all things in the name of Christ. And you've got in Paul's writing to the Thessalonian congregation, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, he says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. So true thanksgiving is the expression <clears throat> To Godward, and it is an expression of joy that He's given me these things. Are we happy with what we have? That's a big thing, too. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I've been to be content. Are we happy with what we have? Because America cultivates this I want some more. I want more. I want more. I want more. That's covetousness, which is idolatry. You go ask a person who has an abundance of wealth, many of them, and they don't consider, they, they will say they've got money, they, they've got sense enough to add and subtract. <laughs> they, know, they know they've got more money than a lot of folks, maybe most folks. But rich to them is just a little more. <laughs> Why does a man who, who, who say, let's, uh, let's say has uh, worked hard and honestly and Made $50 million. Why did, he, why did he work for $100 million? Why did he work for $200 million? Because there are people out there doing it, you know. These folks are billionaires. They started somewhere. And they earned their first dollar. They earned their first hundred, their first thousand, their first ten thousand, their first million. Why are they $2 billion? Why? How much is enough? Nothing wrong to work hard, work honestly, be frugal, be a good steward of God's word, use your money in a right way. The Bible's full of material that tells us that because you cannot serve God in manner, manum. You'll either love the one, hate the other, hate the one, love the other. You just can't do both. So we're taught to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We use what we have. But are we thankful? Do we appreciate what we have? Every one of us in this room has far more than most of the world in material things. Far, far more. I think one of the greatest things you could do as a young person being raised in America, basically in the middle class range or even older, uh, more as far as money is concerned, is travel the world for the, before you get out of the college years and go to the third world countries and see how the average one of them lives. And then come home and stand up in America and say, what a sorry country this is. While we're walking in the grace of God in material things. By God's grace, we have what we have. Because most of the world doesn't have it. Just material things. And so giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. An important matter. The expression of joy over to Godward for what we have. And remember, 
over there in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, where he's giving you the component parts of the singular fruit of the Spirit, that's one of them, the expression of thanksgiving and joy. <clears throat> this is something that the child of God's to be abounding in, not just cruising around the edges, but being thankful. Now, don't you think that's something that parents need to demonstrate in their own lives and then in instruction? Point out to these children, look what you have. Look what you've got. And then bring it over to spiritual matters. How many people in this world can reach over and get a Bible and have it at their disposal? A lot of places don't. And I've been to a few of those places. And I've shared with you, I think, some time ago, more than once, of the man in China who received a Bible. It was the first Bible he'd ever seen. I, I, can't, I, I couldn't conceive of that, but I saw it. I saw him sit there and turn it over, open it up and look at it, and the translator was telling us that that's the first Bible he's ever seen. We were sitting around under the big picture of Mao Zedong in a communist office under the red flag. The only reason we could do that because the communist official had invited us up there and invited all of his people in who were the foreman of his company. And they, he, I guess they had to go. <laughs> they came in and listened to us preach. Isn't that something? And yet that's something we take for granted. But, you know, you still have these good, thankful, godly, faithful brethren who say, do I have to do this in order to go to heaven? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Think about that when you're singing songs of that nature. I think the most thrilling and encouraging word for the welcome comes in the opposite thought of that which is found in verse 5. If the fornicator... The unclean person and the covetous, covetous person who is an idolater hath no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Then it must be self-evident that those who are not joint partakers with them have such an inheritance. This is the same message that Paul gave to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, this is the inheritance that the inspired apostle Peter spoke of when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy begat us again unto a lively hope. American Standard says living hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the dead. Unto, that's in order to do a given thing, unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 3, 4. How do you read that as a member of the church and not hear him speaking directly to you personally? Reserved in heaven for you. Now we've all gone to places ball games or whatever, and I had reserved seats. Got on a little plane, we've had a reserved seat. It's waiting on you. It's in your name. We've even seen people, and we may have got in the wrong seat at the time when we were trying to get in our own, just misread it, and they'd get up and move for somebody else. Well, they had to get up and move for us. That's, that's my seat. <laughs> I don't mean that in a selfish manner. It's reserved for you. And what is he saying? There's a place in heaven reserved for the faithful. And if you're faithful, that means you. Now, to me, that's important because I don't care whether you're 15 or you're 95 or anywhere in between or 105. If you're a faithful child of the living God and all that the New Testament teaches that to be, then my name's written in the book of life. It's waiting on us. And you see, as we're exhorted to be faithful, such as in Hebrews chapter 11, then you go into chapter 12, and we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? They're all in the stadium 
They've run their race. They've won. And now they're rooting for us. And that's the way it ought to be for all of us. Yes, there's that kingdom. That eternal kingdom. And you must enter the Lord's kingdom here. Be a citizen of it and be a faithful citizen to enjoy the inheritance of the eternal kingdom. Luke 10 and verse 25. Just as the physical constitution cannot inherit it, neither can the morally corrupt inherit it. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning verse 15, verses following. Indeed, it is the crown that fadeth not away. You know, I've seen the royal state crowns, some others have, of the United Kingdom. I read the history of how they put the whole thing together. It's amazing. Extreme amount of money involved in it. And you think of that and how beautiful it is, what it represents to them especially. And yet even just the, just the material wealth that's in the thing and the precious stones and so forth. And that is going to fade. It'll melt when all the other elements melt. But not this crown of life it's reserved in heaven for you and for me and for everybody that love and keep God's commandments and it doesn't fade away what is there that you possess even your body today that's not in the process of fading away your shirt your eyeglasses your car your house all of it's in the process of fading away. And at one point in the future, God will just end it all and there won't be any more. But we are children of God. We serve God as children of God. He's our Heavenly Father. We are children, as it says, of light. 1 John 1, 5 through 8. Same terminology used by John in the Gospel of John. John 8, verse 12. Thus we bear the character of God through following Christ, doing His will, molding our minds in the likeness of Christ. As children of light, we are in therefore what? The kingdom of light, verse 9, which is goodness, righteousness, and truth. We have to study the Bible to understand what all that means. So what a joyous welcome it will be when, it's so easy to say it now, but then when it's all over, and from the very lips of our Savior to His dear children, well done. And He tells us to enter in to that city. To me, these words are encouraging. They're not just words to be quoted at a funeral. They're words to be quoted to us every day as we face Satan and fight the fight of faith. That reward's there. Just as real as we're here now physically. So when a question arises that brings forth the question, well, what's wrong with it? We need to ask, really, and we need to train ourselves to ask this, what is right with it? Does it help us draw closer to God or does it thrust us further away? With the Christian, it's a matter of, according to what we've been studying all through here, imitating or following God by obeying Christ. Nothing wrong with asking the question. In fact, all, it's, it's right about it. Uh, what would God do? Why do I know what would God do? Because I can read what Jesus did. When you have seen me, ye have seen the Father. And though, so he leaves us his will. He's blazed the trail for us, did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He's left the road map in his last will and testament, the New Testament, written so we could understand it. So we need to ask, what would Jesus do? And this proves to me that the Christian life is one of simply imitating God and Christ and not partaking of evil, if you want to sum it all up. And that's important to be able to do that. Light is often used by the New Testament writers then as a synonym for truth and righteousness, while darkness represents sin and error. 
we see John drawing the contrast between them. And so Christians are not simply, I say not simply, in the light. They are light. Do you think of yourself as being light? In Matthew 5, 14. So as Jesus himself, while he was in the flesh on this earth, is the light of the world, John 8, 12. So we're now on this earth. Christ rules at the right hand of God in heaven. We know what he wants us to do because we have his last will and testament. We live according to it as it directs us. And we, therefore, are his light in the world, John 8, 12. So we reflect that light. How? Simple. Do what he said in the way he said do it. And for the reason, sometimes there's more than one reason that he said do it. And Paul points out that they previously had, as we said earlier, been in darkness. They didn't know the truth. But they were obligated to walk now as children of light. Listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. What does that mean? Well, think about what we've already said studying the Bible. We are of the truth. How? We believe it. We follow it. We change our lives to fit it. We look at things through the truth, not through the ways of the world. Living a life of membership in his spiritual body will always produce good fruit. Chapter 5 and verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Righteousness is that quality of being right or just. It has to do with your character. And truth denotes the true teaching of the gospel in contrast to erroneous teachings or perversions of it. Now, I said I'd I haven't done it today as much as I have before in this series, but I've used several Greek words, but I'm citing these basically found in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, which is all designed for the English reader. So the Christian life is circumscribed by these qualities. But the fruit of the Spirit, singular fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, that's self-control. Against such there is no law, Galatians 5, 22, 23. Think about that. And any one of those, those component parts of the Spirit, of the fruit of the Spirit, you can go as far as you want to. There's no limitation on being long-suffering or joy or peace or gentleness or goodness or faith or meekness or self-control. You go as far as you can go. And every one of those. And that's what you're doing all the days of your life, that you're in the family of God on this earth because you follow him as dear children. And then verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. That involves my mind, my thinking, my rational ability, my intellect. I'm having to contrast and compare my life with the divine pattern. I'm always trying to do better. Remember those fellows I mentioned a while ago, these bodybuilders? They never stop. They keep working because if they stop, they're going to go down. So they keep working harder and harder. The phrase proving what is acceptable unto the Lord carries us back to what we emphasized in every one of these, especially the first couple of these. This is an imperative. To say it's an imperative means you must do this. I want to go to heaven. All right, you must do this. Think of the weightlifter. You want your muscles to be toned and grow and develop? You must do this. Yeah, but it hurts. You must do this. Take up your cross and follow me. And a cross in those days was a horrible instrument of torture. But serving God, there's a cross to bear. Denying oneself is the first thing, one of the hardest things Americans in the world in general, but Americans have to do is to deny oneself. Yeah, but I want to do that. I like this. You're messing up my whatever. Well, where is your heart? Where is your thoughts? People anchored to this world don't want to be bothered 
with getting what this world has to offer. So the gospel becomes a bother to them. But to those who have learned it, loved it from the heart, obeyed it, and know it is the way to glory in eternity, as dear children, they follow. They know the worth of it because this life passes away. However little or much you have, however healthy or weak you are, however brief or long your life of the flesh is, it ends. And then what? Walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So the sense of this admonition is that we are to test or to examine. It really has to do like one would assay metals so as to establish what's pleasing in the sight of God. Again, another common passage is Romans chapter 2, or rather 12 and verse 2, and be not conformed. That's something I, and notice the be not. That's an imperative. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's effort. That's work. But notice it's all according to the will of God. It's not doing what I want to do or some other people have invented as to the way to be pleasing to God. It's taking God at His word. That's the simplest definition I can give you of faith in God. Take Him at His word. Go back to the sermon this morning. Did Noah take God at His word when it came to preparing to escape the flood? He did. Thus did God, uh, Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. And I only know you can go with every person you find listed by the Holy Spirit as faithful to God. They took him at his word. So we're to prove teachers and we're to prove whether the teaching is true before we accept what's promulgated. Most people don't do that. If they like you, they think you're wonderful and you smell good and uh, dress well and you pat them on the back. In other words, good politician. If you tell them what they want to hear, then, boy, he's a fine person. That's not the way the Bible says gauge it. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, 1 John 4 and verse 1. That's my job. That's what's, what has to do with me walking in the light, making sure I live it, I teach it. So the standard of testing the rightly divided Word of God, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. That's what you have the Bereans doing. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether these things were so. Let's look at that a little more. Three things stand very clearly out before us concerning the people of Berea. From this verse, we know it. The first one is that they receive the word with all readiness of mind. The rest of it might as well not follow if your mind is not ready to receive the teaching of the Bible as they are the word of God to direct and lead you out of sin into a faithful life, stay faithful, and enter into heaven. So they had open hearts to the truth. They wanted to know they're the people that hungered and thirsted after righteousness. Sometimes we try to get people to, we mean well, we love their soul really more than they know to love their soul, and we try to get people to, to, to obey the gospel, to be baptized, but they haven't even reached first base yet. They're not ready to receive the truth. It's, it's not moving them. Something else more important to them. And until you can get the truth of the living God to be more important to them than their necessary food, you can't get to first base. The second thing that comes out of this is that they search these scriptures daily. They had inquiring minds. And they were earnest in their disposition. And the third thing that comes out of this, they recognize the scriptures as the standard, not one standard among many, but the standard which determined whether things were so. People tell you something, is God said this, God said that. Well, 
may be, may not be. How are you going to find out? And you won't if you don't have the right attitude toward the Word of God and to study it correctly. So we're to test every word, every thought, every action to determine what's acceptable and what is well-pleasing to God, Philippians 4.18. Some people, I fear greatly, in fact, I, I know it's a fact, they're thinking about, well, will this please mom and daddy? Will this please my wife? Will this please my husband? What will my children think about me if I do this? But if it's the truth of God and you know it, and the Bible says you can know it and know that you know it, then you act upon it. Because Jesus has already told us that you must love him more than father and mother, son or daughter. God comes first. He will not accept second place. So having been admonished to walk as children of light, verse 8, and being circumscribed in the Christian life by these things, goodness, righteousness, and truth, verse 9, and further having been told to prove that which is acceptable to the Lord, verse 10, Paul goes on to state, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Chapter 5 and verse 11, this will cover the remainder of the time I'm going to spend this afternoon on this. There is a mouthful said there. You read it very fast. But there's much that comes out of this verse. Notice the works of darkness, that which is contrary to the teaching of the New Testament, are unfruitful because they produce nothing of lasting value and they do not add to the quality of life. They'll take you away from where you get the true quality of life, the truth of God, the light. Jesus said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John 3, 19. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. It shows us, that is, this verse does, that fellowship may be with works as well as with persons. Fellowship may be with works as well as with persons. All my life as a Christian, I've been involved with fellowshipping people I've never met. I met them in the sense that I knew what they believed and what they practiced as best we could, and so have other Christians. But I never met them. When I pray for the Lord's church and my brethren throughout the world, I'm praying for people I probably will never meet on this earth but we'll meet in heaven if we all remain faithful some advance the theory that we do not have fellowship with things but only with people that's not true we send help to people we've never met we have fellowship with things and those things go to help them in their work You've done the same thing. You may never have thought that much about it, but you have. If people are our brethren, we may have fellowship with them. Notwithstanding the things they practice or the doctrines they teach, but the apostle here in this passage admonishes strongly that we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works. There it is. Of darkness. Thus, it indicates that we may extend fellowship to practices as well as persons. And we've got to be careful then what the work is doing. You may never meet the people doing the work, but you give to support the work. What is the work authorized by God? We're to be ready to do every good work. Well, I've got to know what the Bible teaches is a good work. Or I may be supporting a good work. It's not a good work. He's already stated in verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Well, false teachers that I know anything about don't care whether you care about them or not. Just send me the money. That's what they care about. Look at these characters on television. They want you to send the money. It's always been amazing to me how dumb we are. 
and especially people that send money to them. They're saying, well, you know, everything you send to me, God's going to multiply it, send me $100, he'll give you a million, all this stuff. But they never seem to apply that to themselves. Who are they giving to? If God's going to give you multiplied amounts more, if you give a little, do they practice that too? Well, as far as I know, they're spending it on themselves. But you don't have to be in that position to still be a partaker with others. You can have somebody comes up wanting money and say, okay, here, I'm sorry for you. Here's the money. What's he going to spend it on? We have the obligation to know what he's going to spend it on before we stick money in their hands. But that's not saying this. Tell me what he would have to write to say it. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying know where your money's going. Know what it's supporting. So he further states here, not just fellowship with people, but with works. The word fellowship has reference then to communion. Koinonia is the Greek word, and it means communion, sharing, or participation. Well, what's he saying? We're not to participate in or to share in the unfruitful works of darkness. Couldn't be clearer. And this would include the idea that we're not to encourage, approve, or endorse such works. And John makes that clear in 2 John verses 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, the American Standard says, goeth onward, going, in other words, beyond the truth, hath not God. Is that hard to understand? <laughs> He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bidding God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. In my first full time work, I was visiting in a place of business owned by one of the elders. And this character came by with a guitar strapped across his back, and he was taking up collections for his particular group. And I was sitting by the elder's wife, and the old man, being a good businessman, gave him some money and sent him on his way. Well, I guess she thought that I noticed that, which I did, and she started trying to make excuses for him, and I hadn't said a word yet. <laughs> They knew their conscience condemned them. They knew scriptures like this. They haven't been busy supporting that which proponed false things. But people do it. Just get rid of them. Here, take this. I got a whole collection of Jehovah's Witness material still in my office over here that was given me by an accountant when I was in my first work, took care of my tax and so forth. And I was down visiting with them. He was not a member of the church. And because I was a preacher, he said, here, you might like these. Well, I sure did. It was a library of Jehovah's Witness works. And what he would do, like a lot of folks, rather than give into it with them, he'd just take their book and send them on their way, take their book, send them on their way, give them if they wanted 15 cents for it, he, he did that. And that's where most people are. And most people, like we talked about this morning, will say, well, what, what does that hurt? What little thing like that? Well, if you can read these verses and understand words, and words have meanings, and they're from the Word of God, it ought to mean a whole lot. We also learn from this passage that it's not sufficient merely to have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Listen, but we're to expose them. Now, usually when you think of a person exposing himself, it has bad connotations. And why does it? Because he's exposed his nakedness. Well, what do you think this means when he says expose a false teacher? It means do what's necessary for people to see his naked false doctrine for what it is. And you'll find a lot of brethren say, oh, no, 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 get into that. We, not, we, we must not, and this is what he's teaching, we must not only be passive in regard to evil in that we do not participate therein, but we must also be active in opposing, exposing, and reproving it. And that's what he's saying. Now, I'm going to stop here, but I'm going to remind you of how we started. 
This is an imperative if you're going to be faithful and go to heaven. Don't want to go to heaven? Ignore it. And you won't. For even one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. John 3 and verse 20. Christians don't participate in any way in error. And they reprove the works of darkness by turning people to light. In other words, shining the light of truth upon the error and exposing it for what it is. If you're not a child of God, remember these words are written to children of God. Telling them if you're going to be faithful to what you've been called to do as dear children, follow your father. He knows how to get you from earth to heaven. It may mean a lot of sacrifice on your part. But look what Jesus did for us. Look at the horrible, shameful, painful, drawn out persecution and death that Jesus underwent to save me. Now I'm a part of his spiritual body. I'm a child of his father. I'm to continue on and take up my cross and follow him. That means following him according to the light of truth, teaching the truth, examining myself in the light of it, to make sure I am in it, and to tell other folks what the truth is and expose the error. And if we have a view of preaching the gospel that does not allow for the exposing of the error that captivates people or will carry them into eternity in hell, something's wrong with our own concepts and needs to be changed. If you need to become a Christian, not only you know that, as far as your mind, God searching it with you, then we urge you to do that by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him that He is the Son of God, and being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, have you sinned privately, known only to you and God? Humbly repent of it, ask him for forgiveness. But it must be repented of, whether public or private, and confess to God for all sin ultimately is against him, and sin separates us. We need to be forgiven of God. And we can be. He wants to. God stands ready right now to forgive everybody on this earth of sin. But we must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ to be saved, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.